I want to jump into the lessons, and again, very humbly offered, but these are the lessons that we've learned over those 25 years. The first is, if you want a strong message to be delivered, first fortify the messenger. Now, for some reason in our field of work, this is something that we shy away from talking about. We put a big emphasis on resources and supports to our client group, whatever that might be, in the case of Phoenix, it's youth, but we seldom get into talking about the importance of making sure that we are fortified to carry an essential message forward. And the way into this discussion maybe, believe it or not, is most easily made by going back 2,400 years. I want to talk Plato. Who would have thunk? But I want to talk Plato, and Plato, for those that are following along at home, I think I'm okay in the safety of those that are here in the room, but for those that are following along on your computers, uh, you know, if any of you are philosophy majors, forgive me for what I'm about to do in the next two minutes, because uh, this is one of the most beautiful pieces, right, in the philosophy world. This is just a beautiful text, deep in meaning in a thousand different directions. I'm about to give the Coles Notes version. So, some of you may know this. For those that don't know the allegory of the cave, here's how the story opens. The story opens in a dark cave. Multi-leveled cave, only lit by the light of a fire. And on the very bottom level are a group of individuals that are presently now and have spent their whole lives being shackled. They can only look in one direction, it's towards the wall. They're chained there, and that's how they've lived out their existence. Above them on the next level is quite a bit of activity, and that's where the fire is. So the fire casts the light on the wall that the folks down below are looking at. And so the folks that are changed start to construct their understanding of the world based exclusively on the reflections that they're seeing on that wall. That becomes their reality. So the characters they see, they assign names to and roles to, and they construct this whole world of being based only on those reflections. And above them are folks that are unchained, that are around the fire, and all kinds of activity is happening all about. Something happens, and interestingly in the text it doesn't identify specifically what, but something happens, and some of those folks that had been chained are now free. And so they wander up to the next level, and what they discover on the next level is the reflections that they have built their lives around, understanding as the truth, are not actually the truth, they're a reflection of activity that are happening on the next level, and so they're just starting to make that adjustment. They're starting to get a sense of what? That, that thing that we've constructed and based our lives on is not the reality? This other level of existence is the reality, and so they're starting to adjust to that, and in the light of the fire, they see more and more and understand more and more, only to discover that they see a stream of sunlight coming through the opening into the cave and realize there is yet another level of light and of being. And so they wander up uh, with great excitement into that space and are almost blinded by the brightness and intensity of that light. And yet they're excited to be there, and over time their eyes adjust, and they understand their world now in a whole new way, based on being in that light. But here's the thing, and here's the part of the story that I want to focus on. In that moment, they feel this obligation to go back and to share this new reality and this new experience with the folks that are chained several levels below. So they do that, and they rush into the cave, and in their excitement, their eyes can't make the adjustment. And so the people that are chained below see these folks that they start to mock because they're running into walls and tripping over boulders and in their excitement are just literally spilling into the cave. And the folks who are chained below think they are drunk with some kind of new knowledge that if this is what it does to you, surely we should be cautious of it. And the folks that have come in, all excited to share their enlightenment, can't understand why the folks that are chained don't embrace this new story that they have to tell and are leery and are cautious of it. So we have two experiences that are at odds. And those experiences are only bound together in a productive way if there exists a level of trust. What can the trust be from those that are 
amazed at the folks that are chained and their lack of desire to embrace this new story and experience, and those that are chained saying, why would I ever want to become you? Look at you walking into walls. I don't understand why you would think that we would be excited about this. The only thing that will bridge that gap is a level of trust and understanding. I want you to think about that wonderful allegory of the cave as it relates to our work on social policy, as it relates to our relationship one with the other in the community side of things, in the not-for-profit sector, as it relates to our relationship with government, as it relates to how we work together or not on building productive and effective ways on addressing issues. Here's the story I want to tell that that relates to in Nova Scotia. So in Nova Scotia, we've done this wonderful piece of work that started with, about four years ago, understanding, trying to understand the need of the not-for-profit sector in Nova Scotia. What we came to learn was there was nothing documented anywhere on the health of the not-for-profit sector in Nova Scotia. We just couldn't find any information that was specific or was of use. And so over time, we started with support, uh, federal money uh, from the federal government and eventually provincial dollars from our provincial government to do research. And that research is available and well documented now. It went incredibly well. We have a copy of that if you're interested in seeing it. And what it told us was the needs of the sector were huge and the presence of the sector was critical of all. We discovered, much to our amazement, that there's more people that work in the not-for-profit sector in Nova Scotia than there is the construction in province-wide. Four times our province is so well known. So we started to learn uh, more about ourselves, and we got in deep into that research and then realized what we needed to do was start to build to a common voice, a common voice and a common effort and a common presence around doing collaborative work. Please understand that the context in which those discussions started was a historically largely fractured not-for-profit sector in Nova Scotia. That was, for very good historical reasons, with lack of resources, was often at odds with competing agendas, and certainly was fractured from meaningful relationship uh, with government. So we started an engagement process and we went nationally to understand what had been done in other regions, what worked well, what should be avoided. We came back to Nova Scotia, we shared all of that information and engaged very actively across the province around the kinds of things that have worked in other regions and what it is that we would dream of putting aside our individual agendas, looking at a joint agenda and wanting to talk actively about if we were to do common ground work, what would that consist of? How do we get our skill up and how do we do the kinds of things that would fortify us to carry forward the essential messages that we are entrusted with a sacred trust to carry? The amazing happened. Agendas were aside, folks much better than Phoenix became involved and we worked collaboratively to the point that now we're in a development stage and we hope and are close to having the anticipated outcome be that as early as January, we may for the first time have a province-wide, not-for-profit sector council in Nova Scotia that will voice to important issues and help us ensure that we are at our very strongest, build our competencies, build our skills, and can carry a message forward. This is an essential piece. Often we focus exclusively on the specific issues related to our youth work and not the context in which we're doing the work and how to carry a broader message. So that was an example for us where we stepped back, did that work, and it has paid off a thousand times in our ability to do specific and directed work around policies related to our client group of young people and their families. 